The Lord of the Rings Online is a free-to-play MMO with optional subscription and in-game purchases, featuring tab-target combat with an older leveling style obviously taking place in Middle-earth. Originally developed by Turbine and released in the year 2007, through many many updates the game has overgone many changes. For example, the original level cap was 50, now it's 150. But I'm really really excited to get into this, let me explain why. The Lord of the Rings as literature, film, video games, and its multifaceted, highly fantastical world literally helped shape my current understanding of high fantasy and my love for it in life. I watched The Fellowship of the Ring when I was just five years old. I immediately loved the hobbits and Gandalf and the massive world. I deeply feared the Nazgul and the thought of the Eye of Sauron being able to spread its power across any part of the world it could see was unsettling. And as a child, I was absolutely compelled, and it's part of the reason I'm so interested in fantasy novels and even MMOs as well as just standard role-playing games. I mean, I remember playing The Return of the King endlessly on my PlayStation 2 for hours and hours on the same damn level. But for some reason, I never tried Lord of the Rings Online. People often ask me in these videos, how have you never tried this MMO before? And honestly, my love for the genre was mainly focused on two games while growing up, World of Warcraft and RuneScape. I was heavily attached to both those games and still love them for what they are, but I was apt to try anything new. Especially when it comes to the MMO genre, it takes so much for an MMO to be good, and it takes so little for it to lose its charm. It's genuinely one of the most difficult genres for game developers to do right. So that's been the focus of my channel, is finding out what was done right and what could be worked on. Even if the MMO isn't living up to my standards, it's about finding the diamond in the rough or the needle in the haystack. Anyway, let's get into The Lord of the Rings Online. Can it live up to the standards set by Peter Jackson to adapt the amazing works of Tolkien to another medium? How does Middle-earth feel as an MMO? Let's get into it. There are eight different playable races in the game, however two of them must be purchased and unlocked through the store, the River Hobbit as well as the Stout Axe. There's also 12 distinct classes, once again two of those are purchased through the store, and depending on which of the races you pick, that'll have an effect on which of the 12 classes you can actually play. There's definitely some interesting and unique options, the Lore Keeper uses familiars and magic to offer crowd control, but I generally don't play your typical melee warrior class, and for some reason the champion stood out to me. It seems like they do pretty good damage, I thought the armor featured in the character customization looked pretty cool for chainmail or heavy armor. Waydot, the champion. The character customization options were pretty standard, plenty of different options from facial features to ear rotation. I had a bit of fun in here, but I ended up using the randomize option until I came across this badass grandpa aesthetic. The loading screens are so reminiscent of older style MMOs, it definitely gave me a bit of nostalgia, but they become quite apparent in game as you're gonna come across a lot of loading screens. Usually they're pretty quick and sometimes you're even given tidbits of the story throughout these. The user interface is very typical and easy to understand, a quest tracker on the right side, you can hit escape for most of your options, but also any menus that you might need to get to can be found to the right and left of your action bar. After messing around a bit with customization and options, I was introduced to Strider, and what I can only assume is a bit of a tutorial. Enough! Voice acted? Nice. I was immediately thrust into combat against these two while trying to escape the prison. I started with four abilities, and it appears that there's a bit of a building and spending system where certain abilities will give me a resource to use other abilities. A couple of moments later, I was greeted with an enemy who flew up about 20 feet into the air. And then he landed in front of me like it hardly phased him. I couldn't tell if this was a scare tactic used by NPCs in The Lord of the Rings Online, but I can say for certain that I was definitely a little shaken. I helped some more hobbits and witnessed Strider attempt to fend off a Nazgul, which was pretty badass. Tutorial over and I landed in a small town, Arquette. Waydot, the level 1 champion, ready to take on what Middle-earth has to offer. I picked up a few of the quests in the area which are marked by a ring on the minimap. Blue not so glowy rings are quests that you've accepted, normal golden rings are quests that you can accept, and red glowy rings are quests that you can turn in or NPCs that you can talk to which will continue your progression. There is of course a map which features your currently tracked quests showing you where you need to go, which NPCs you might need to talk to, or highlighting areas of the map which contain objectives. After doing some of the quests around town, I had been rewarded, quite generously really, with a few pieces of armor. This chainmail had me feeling exceptionally badass, though I have to admit the arms were looking chunky. <laughs> I don't know why they look like that. 
One thing I was beginning to notice very quickly is that, yep, this is an old school MMO. Walking from place to place was slow, level progression was slow, questing was slow. This hardly takes away from the game as I'm one of those MMO players who absolutely prefers the journey over the destination. I think the leveling and gearing up process of a lot of MMOs can be one of the most enjoyable aspects of the game. I was also beginning to notice a pattern of pick up six quests, go complete them all, go hand in all six, and then six more will pop up. As I noticed later on, you're sometimes heading out with like 10 to 15 quests, all generally within the same vicinity, which is actually kind of nice. You always feel like you're productively working towards your character's progression. The map was nicely color coded so you could differentiate between each quest in your tracker. However, unfortunately, the map would only tell you the name of your quest, so unless you remembered the name, you'd have to hop back into your quest journal to find out what your objective was. I got myself to level 4, and I even managed to pick up a cape as a quest reward, which had me feeling much more champion-like. My outfit was complete, and my fully chainmail pudgy arms champion was actually beginning to look like a bit of a threat. As early as character customization is when you're first introduced to monetization within Lord of the Rings, which is pretty standard for free-to-play MMOs, especially when they're over 15 years old. However, I was not expecting what happened next. I was introduced to a quest which could unlock a mount. Hell yes. This game features a ton of traveling and anything used to speed that up would be massively welcome at this point. However, this quest actually has two functions. First of all, to get your mount but it also serves as a monetization tutorial, which will introduce you to the unlocking quest system. You see, there are certain quests in the game which are locked behind a currency which you must purchase in one way, shape, or form. The currency is known as Lord of the Rings Online Points. These can be acquired in a multitude of ways, but almost all of the ways do indeed require spending real life money. So you can purchase the subscription or the VIP, which is $15 a month, and that'll get you 500 points every month. You can also purchase them directly with 600 points costing about $8. There are some ways that you can get these points in game, a very small amount of them, from completing deeds or obtaining various reputations with factions in the game. This quest also introduces you to the store where you can purchase plenty of cosmetics, in-game items, in-game benefits, the whole nine yards. In my personal opinion, introducing new players to all of this monetization, especially this early in the game, with the promise of getting a mount and giving you an almost tutorial of how to spend your real life money, is unfortunately leaving a sour taste in my mouth. Especially when considering that we're talking about The Lord of the Rings, one of the most foundational stories and worlds ever written. I was not a fan. I must say, I think the term free to play needs to be used rather loosely with this game, as it's more of a free to try game. And if you really want to progress further, especially at a higher level, a subscription and some purchases are definitely going to become almost required. Either way, moving on, I had acquired my horse, and the increase in speed was slight. And jumping looked a little silly. But I was happy to have this guy, as anything to speed up the distances that I was already having to travel would be a welcome benefit to me. Now, the game's story actually takes place during the same time frame as the literature. So oftentimes you're introduced to some familiar faces, and you actually interact with and complete quests or missions which might aid the Fellowship in their journey. Even some early cutscenes featured the Fellowship entering the minds of Moria. I got to witness You Shall Not Pass in real time, and my inner nerd was satiated. I was curious how Waydot, the level 5 champion, was going to fit into all of this. The story quests also often feature instances where major events will happen. For example, the town of Arquette was raided and pillaged, and I had to work to save the town and rescue the captain. Some more questing in the area got me to level 6, and that's when through opening random interfaces, I actually found out that you could specialize your class a little bit further. It's pretty standard, each class has three different specializations that it can delve into. A blue, a red, and a yellow. For me, blue was a tanking spec, red was single target, and yellow was AoE. The yellow sounded pretty interesting to me. You can also further specialize your character by assigning them certain racial specializations that you unlock at later levels. And even further than that, you can use something called virtue traits, which are permanent passive buffs that can be leveled from 1 to 75, but you can only have a few of them active on your character at a time. Afterwards, it was time to press forward, time to move on to the next area, and I journeyed on the road towards Combe. The map in this area was quite a bit larger and appeared a little overwhelming to me at first until I realized that it was essentially just a zoomed out map of where I was before. Arquette in the forested area was actually quite a small area compared with what I had to work with now, and the scale of the game was definitely beginning to stand out to me. 
I found some crafting and gathering skill trainers, and I ended up choosing Metalsmith, because I'm a champion wearing metal, and prospecting, because I figured that would feed into metalsmithing. Some questing in the Chetwood area had already got me to level 8, and though leveling was quite slow, it was pretty compelling. My progress felt good. However, at this point, I was finding combat still remained thoroughly uninteresting. Nothing presented a challenge, and this could be due to the fact that I was playing an exceptionally tanky and survival-focused class, but I mean, I could pull many mobs at once, and so far, I really hadn't run into any difficulty in terms of combat. It appeared you could line up skills in a sort of queue to use them. This is still just a theory for me, as sometimes using other abilities seemed to cancel this queue. However, I will say the combat did not feel very reactive. It often felt like I walked up to an enemy, spammed a few buttons, and walked away. Not many of my abilities carried much weight or felt more or less powerful than any of my other abilities. Obviously, these are my first impressions, and they're probably subject to change later on, uh, within the game and through playing other classes, but so far combat just seemed exceptionally standard, bordering on mediocrity. I achieved level 10 and even unlocked something called Monster Play, which sounded exciting and was definitely something I wanted to delve into at a later point. But I decided to call it a day. If you're a regular of my channel, you may have noticed the missing face cam for the video so far. I was, and still kind of am, a little under the weather. But I was looking forward to continuing my journey through Middle Earth when I was feeling a bit better. That is, until I tried to log in again, and I was stuck at this loading screen. I thought, hmm, maybe the game froze, I'll restart and try again. When I reopened the game, it appeared like my character wasn't wearing any armor. That can't be good. I could have swore I had armor on prior to this. I got stuck at a loading screen again, but after my third attempt, we finally managed to make it back into the game. Luckily, I still had all my things. Then I found the slowest escort quest to ever exist within an MMORPG. This lady walks at an absolutely thrilling 3 centimeters an hour. She was moving so slow, I even had time to come up with a little joke. Sarah Okart is so slow that when she tried to cross the road, she got a parking ticket. <laughs> anyway, at this point, I had picked up some tools and I was actually able to mine the next copper deposit that I came across. And actually, I found out something that was really pretty awesome. You can mine, and I'm assuming do any other gathering skill, while mounted. There's no animation to show that you're gathering, like when you're not mounted. However, there is a progress bar, which shows that the action is being completed. I actually think more games should use this system. The constant mounting and dismounting and remounting process of gathering in other MMOs has always seemed rather redundant to me, so this was definitely a welcome surprise. The game operates on a day and night cycle, from dawn to dusk, with no particular point of the day lasting longer than 27 minutes in real life time. This apparently can have some effects on the quests that are available to you, as well as certain mobs being in certain areas. However, so far I had not personally witnessed this. One thing I did notice, however, is when it was nighttime and I was walking into the town of Combe, it was very, very cozy. The older graphics mixed with the cottage style of buildings and medieval lighting had a bit of charm, and it stood out to me. Of course, graphics from 2007 can't really be held to the standard that we might have formed for graphics in the modern age of gaming, however, they can still be appreciated from time to time for the charm that remains even many years later. Unfortunately, my time enjoying the graphical charm was cut short as I was met with one of the worst bouts of rubber banding that I've ever experienced in an MMO in the past five years. I hoped that the issue was on my end and not the game having server issues, but as someone who doesn't often experience this level of connection issues in other games, I had my doubts. I was level 11 and quickly made my way to the area of Stadel. I was constantly surprised at how many quests there were to pick up in every new area. You always had some objective to work towards, which was pretty nice. I got myself a decent two-handed sword, which I decided to try out, as up to this point I had only been dual wielding. Using a different weapon style doesn't change much about your gameplay or any of your abilities, it just seems to have different stats and changes your attack speed. But then I found myself experiencing a little bit more rubber banding while questing through the spider-infested swamp, which further confirmed my fears of there being potential server issues. Hopefully, it was just a today issue and wouldn't continue to plague my progress moving forward. Eventually, I was directed toward the town of Bree, which I guess could be considered the first real city within the game that I had entered. At this point, I had seen a few other players throughout the game here and there, and I was quite hopeful that I would see more entering the city. But honestly, there weren't too many around here. I assume they're all congregating at higher level parts or different areas of the game. However, I did come across this dwarf 
who was level 120. He looked pretty cool, so I decided to inspect him, and all of his gear was named Heroes This or Heroes That. So my assumption is that this is a character who used a boost to get to level 120, and that this was some of the default gear that was given to you to begin your adventure. Pretty neat though, the dude had like 34,000 HP, so I was pretty jealous. At level 15, I was told that I had unlocked the player-owned house system, which I didn't realize was something that Lotro actually featured. So that sounded pretty interesting to me and was definitely something I wanted to check out later on. Another thing is that in each zone, there are certain mobs, and when you mouse over them, you can see achievements that are related to slaying a certain amount of that mob. So when I had killed 60 brigands within the area, I was actually rewarded with a bunch of gear that far outleveled or outpowered what I was currently wearing. Either way, I thought this achievement system was pretty cool, and now, knowing that the rewards can be so beneficial is definitely something I'm going to keep my eye on moving forward. I then came across a fast travel system, which was nice to see, because up until this point, I was pretty confused how people were getting around Middle Earth without just trekking the entire way. Basically, once you visit an area's stable, you can use other stables within the area to fast travel to them. If the area is still within your zone, you'll hop on a mount and quickly make your way over there. However, there is also a swift fast travel that's more expensive and it's available for certain major cities or areas. The swift travel basically acts as a teleport. After that, I thought the quest guide on my map was actually hiding part of my map and thus my current objective that I was working towards. But it turns out that I'm actually just a troglodyte and you can actually move your quest tracker around. Moving on. I quickly brushed sides with the Shire and got a glimpse of Hobbiton, though none of my current quests actually had me going in that direction, not yet anyway. Around this area, I was met with more unlockable quests, including this quest pack here, the Wildwood. Costing about 1200 Lotro points, so essentially $16, you can get yourself over 80 quests and deeds in Wildwood, starting with the availability at level 20. That's a no thank you from me, but interesting. I made my way into the Lone Lands to the east of Bree and actually got myself to level 20. In order to put a bit of a timeline on this for you guys, I had about 17 hours played at this moment. Level 20 is pretty interesting as it unlocks the Instance Finder, where you can attempt to find a group or a fellowship for different dungeons or instances within the game. It didn't appear that anyone was really around this area or queuing up for instances around my level. However, I had a quest to try out this dungeon under the Forsaken Inn. It gave me the option to go in solo, so I decided to try it out. This dungeon features traps and riddles using emotes and different mobs which were not necessarily difficult, however some of the riddles definitely took me a few minutes. I'm just kidding. Google. Google exists. I eventually died to these spinning spike traps and I decided that I would come back to it at a later time. This was actually my first time experiencing death in Lord of the Rings and it appeared to just revive me at the beginning of the instance with no other real penalties. Some questing later got me to level 22, where I really realized that inventory space was becoming a bit of a problem. First of all, I only have these three bags. Each one has 15 slots, totaling 45 inventory slots. Now, unlike other MMOs where you can just go to a vendor and purchase more bags, in Lord of the Rings, you have to go to the Lotro store and purchase more inventory slots using... Lotro points. 325 points for a meager 5 inventory slots. My inventory was constantly filling up while questing throughout the game, and I spent an absurd amount of time just vendoring junk to random merchants, which are sometimes easy to find, but sometimes not so easy. And this leads me to now, where my inventory was filling up with these chests. Okay, cool. I need a black steel key to open these. That should be easy enough. Oh, those are also purchasable on the store using Lotro points. Okay, we quickly destroyed those and moved on. Afterwards, the story quest took me to meet Gandalf, which was positively amazing, and I quickly realized that my character is actually taller than him. It's just like it would be if I were to meet Gandalf in real life, as I am exceptionally tall and absurdly manly. He sent me over to Rivendell, which I have to say was absolutely beautiful. This place caught me off guard, and entering the city from a hillside view took me right back to watching The Fellowship of the Ring and seeing Rivendell for the first time as a child. Here was my first introduction to The Fellowship in-game where I met Aragorn, Boromir, Gimli, and Legolas. Aragorn gave me a bunch of quests to go and do instances, however, as I figured before, there probably weren't many people actively doing those at this time. Now, during the time that I was actually playing Lord of the Rings Online, uh, the game actually entered the time frame for its Yule Festival. 
which is essentially its in-game Christmas event. And even though Christmas doesn't necessarily exist in the canonical lore of Middle-earth, this festival was a nice break from all of the questing that I had been doing prior. With tons of cosmetic rewards, even some decent XP from doing silly tasks like cleaning up parties and waking up drunk people, I actually hit level 24 in this area. I saw lots of different players and it was probably the first real bit of like silly fun that I had in the game. It was my first real experience of any sort of sense of community. And I went to bed that night feeling slightly better about Lord of the Rings Online and thinking maybe I had been too harsh in my judgment of the game thus far. The next day I logged in and well, my character looked a lot more idiotic in the login page than I had initially thought. My mismatched gear looked horrendous. I continued questing in the Lone Lands when I came across this. My quest log was full, but guess what? You can purchase more space if you would like to using Lotro points. And then something happened immediately after, and I'm just going to roll the clip. <clears throat> well, I'll be honest, guys. I tried my hardest to play and enjoy Lord of the Rings Online, but it's just, it's nonstop issues this year. Um, do I recommend that people play Lord of the Rings Online in 2023 going on 2024? I can't say that I do. I feel like it's a beautiful world. It's a beautiful game. Uh, so much of the story and what I've been doing has been a lot of fun, but the non-stop issues really take away from the experience. Like, I can't even play right now. Oh, it's too bad. It's too bad, because it's really, there's a great game hidden in here, but this ain't it. And that's that. The jankiness of the game's connectivity and the constant reminders of monetization drove me to a standstill where I no longer wanted or even could continue playing Lotro. Which is a shame, honestly. When I was genuinely enjoying the game, I was having a blast, but this was a bit of a straw that broke the camel's back for me. So with that, let's jump into my review of the game. Due to the nature of me not being able to complete the game to a certain point in standard that I have in these videos, you'll have to take my experience with a bit of a grain of salt, as I wasn't able to put the full 100 hours into the game that I generally do when playing other MMORPGs. However, I think it's important to take into account the fact that I genuinely stopped because the game simply had too many issues for me. Before I talk about the issues and why they're so problematic, however, I would really like to mention some of the good. The game really does have some absolutely amazing things about it, and I would like to point those out. So, number one, this is a bit of a personal one, but taking place in Middle-earth is the absolute best part of this game for me. Being able to interact with Legolas and Aragorn and some of my childhood heroes in one of my favorite mediums, video games, and MMOs, it's definitely what carried this game for me. I was constantly on the lookout for Lord of the Rings lore that I could dig into, and I really regret that I won't be able to dig into it any further. Number two, the slower leveling journey and pacing, which is not a race to end game content, allows you to really live in the moment within the game. You don't have to spend so much time worrying about what level you might be. Progress is what you make it, and the game is about the journey, not necessarily the destination. Number three, the few areas of the map that I was actually able to explore felt massive, and the graphical charm definitely helped here. Rivendell was such a cool moment for me, and the need to travel far and wide in order to complete your objectives really helped bring life to Middle-earth. And finally, it's just a really relaxing game. The questing is straightforward, the progress made sense, the graphics are cozy, the environments and the world building really add an ambience and a sense of immersion that, despite its outdatedness, I don't know how else to say it, but it just felt relaxing. Now, the problems for me, and why I had to unfortunately stop playing. Number one, the jankiness. Not a little bit, a lot. From rubber banding and connection issues, to mobs not registering when I attack them, to literally not being able to log in, my character appearing gearless, the game is old and janky, to the point that playing it becomes tedious at times. Number two. The monetization, the constant reminder of monetization, the pricing, and the predatory nature of all of this accumulates into a feeling of... Uh, from quest to quest space to unique races and classes to inventory space to level boosts, it screams of a dying game holding onto its last financial threads as it milks the remaining player base, cow, until it can no longer exist. Too many games are in this place, but in the world of Lord of the Rings, this really sucked to see. If Tolkien were a gamer, he would be ashamed. Number three, the combat and gameplay was generally mediocre. It felt unresponsive and boring, and in my entire 25 hours of gameplay, I did not face difficulty even once, except for an instance where I was killed by traps instead of NPCs. 
And finally, the lack of other players. I rarely saw or spoke with anyone in this game. It seemed like a single player experience for the most part, which is fine if you're interested in the lore and the story in the world. However, this is an MMORPG, and if player interaction can't be found, that's always going to be a pretty tough point for me. Anyways, with all that said, there is an amazing game hidden underneath these negatives. If you're playing Lord of the Rings Online currently, and you're not having connectivity issues, and you don't take issue with the monetization, I'm sure you can and are having an absolute blast. Can I honestly recommend for potential new players to try out Lord of the Rings Online in 2023? For me, personally, no, not really. I might come back and try this game again in the future if some of the issues that I have get fixed, but unfortunately I had much higher expectations. I was genuinely excited to try out this MMO, and almost from the beginning I was disappointed time and time again. Anyway folks, thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. Uh, if you agree with my review, if you disagree with my review, leave a comment, let me know. Don't forget to like, potentially subscribe, and if you really, really enjoyed my content, there is a link to my Patreon down in the description. These videos take me quite a long time to make, so any further support would be very much appreciated. Anyway, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Later.